The life of a jazz musician is a very precarious life. I was just talking about a, a good friend of mine, a pianist who, um, yeah, he's got a good reputation. Um, he just had a, a sort of a altercation and he was hurt, you know. And uh, jazz musicians, you know, they want to express everything they, and they, their life is sort of right out there on their sleeve. But we live in a world which um, you can't always be that way. I mean, playing is great, but you can't live your life like you're on the bandstand because that's, you have to live a different life when you're off of the bandstand, in the sense of speaking. You have to be a little more conformist. And most jazz musicians find that difficult. More probably artists find it difficult to uh, be, be a more uh, normal person when they're off the bandstand. So uh, the life of a jazz musician is a difficult life because you want to play, you want to be, you want to get to the inner spirit and sometimes you drink or you use drugs or you smoke a lot or you do all these things to try to get the spirit out. So uh, a jazz musician, it, it, it's, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult existence and a lot of the great people that I've known and that in history, they kind of overindulge and they never sort of are able to balance their, their musical life with their personal life. Um, maybe, it's maybe it's not necessary to do that. That's another question, I don't know. But I'd like to see young musicians coming up that don't smoke and that don't drink to excess and don't use drugs and don't sort of debilitate themselves. I think that's where we should go. I think that's what guys should be doing. I, I don't think you have to drink and use drugs to play good jazz, but that's been the model for so long that a lot of guys get uh, caught up in that, you know. I used to be reticent about talking about that because it was always like, um, well, let's stigmatize this jazz musician. Let's talk about, oh, he's a criminal and all. Um, but my wife, uh, my dear departed wife uh, used to tell me, well, no, Sonny, don't be afraid to, or don't, don't not want to talk about it because after all, you've been through it, you came through it, and it's a great experience. You conquered it, so to speak. So um, I, don't, I don't mind talking about it now. We were following our idols, Charlie Parker and, um, uh, we were told Billy Holiday used drugs and all this stuff. But my main influence, our main influence was Charlie Parker. He was our messiah. And Charlie Parker used drugs. So all of us felt, figured that, oh, well, gee, if he used drugs, it's okay. But, um, but it wasn't okay, <laughs> you know, because uh, uh, guys dropped through the holes, you know. And... Um, in my case, I followed uh, Charlie Parker and uh, um, began using, and well, a lot of guys were using drugs, really. It was um, uh, Fats Navarro, the great uh, trumpet player, died at a very early age uh, from drugs. And a lot of the guys were on drugs, really. You know, a lot of the great bebop players. And um, I went along and I get messed up. And uh, it took me quite a while to uh, straighten myself out, you know.
I went through some really terrible times. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know whether I should really even uh, mention it, but uh, you mentioned that I had to go to prison and all that stuff. Well, I mean, so I guess it's that I, but I was in a state, I mean, I, they, they had me in a straitjacket at one time. And, and do you, can you understand what it would feel like to be in a straitjacket? I know, I couldn't either, but I was, and it was brought about by sort of a drug psychosis in prison. I mean, I just went completely, but uh, it was tough. It was tough. I mean, at that time, they put you in, um, there's a place in New York they used to call the tombs. You've probably heard of it. I mean, it was like a living tomb with all the people. So I was there. And uh, the withdrawal, physical symptoms, which were unbelievable. Uh, but um, I... I had my family, you know, I was a very bad guy. I mean, I used to really steal from my house. I mean, I was just an outlaw, outcast. But my mother and my, uh, my father was in the Navy. He wasn't really around during this time. But um, I was a pretty bad guy. Um, but my mother's love and her uh, belief in me, I think, and Charlie Parker, who took me aside and told me that this was not the way to be, that uh, had a tremendous uh, effect on me. So that I finally... Um, realize that, well, this is, you know, I'm not going any place, you know. I'm, I'm a pariah, I mean, people see me coming, they go across the street, you know. So, um, I eventually uh, was able to go to a hospital. There used to be a big hospital in New York, uh, not in New York, in Kentucky, Lexington which was a, a very good place. It was a place where you were able to um, treat uh, addicts, something like the Betty Ford Clinic in later years, you know. Anyway, uh, you were treated in a humane manner as a sick person, not as a criminal. And uh, you went there for a certain amount of time and you took what they call the cure. And this is what, and I went there and voluntarily. And I, I uh, by that time, I was determined to get away from drugs. So I was able to go there, and through my determination to do it, uh, that, that place served me well. Uh, if I didn't have the determination to stop, it, it would not have. It would just have been because there were people that went there that, still use drugs when they came out and so on and so forth. So, but um, it proved to be, uh, several people over the years have come to me asking me about Lexington. In fact, there's a recently a guy who wants to write a book about Lexington, uh, the Narcotics um, Rehabilitation Center there. Um, I don't know if it was called narcotics. It's just a general rehabilitation. I have always been a person that has had a strong sense of right and wrong, a strong spiritual guide or um, guardian angel or uh, belief, maybe, I don't know how to explain, but a, a conscience, maybe, 
there was always something that inside of me that was talking to me all the time. And um, when something talks to me, like, well, but the thing with the drugs, and I re realized something said, yeah, and I finally came to me, well, this is not the way to go, you know. And um, I just have that in me. And when I find something that I want to do, I, I block out everything else and I do it, you know. I mean, it's a sense of right and wrong, you know. So it doesn't matter to me that uh, people are saying, oh, how can you leave the music because, you know, you, they won't accept you back if you go away and, you know, you'll never, you'll lose your edge and all. I mean, this was inconsequential to me because I had a, an idea that I wanted to improve my uh, myself, my musical uh, arsenal, if you will, and uh, so I do. I do what I want to do in that sense. I'm very strong about that, and this has uh, held me in good stead. Just listening to the inner voice, you know. Well, and this is what I, I do, and I'm happy about it, you know, uh, that I have the um, that much determination, if you want to call it that. But that's been my, uh, uh, the, what I've done all my life. And the sabbaticals were the same. I realized I wasn't sounding as good as I, my reputation was. So I, you know, I wanted to kind of get to that point where I wouldn't be ashamed to go on the bandstand, which happened to me one time on a job I was playing with um, Elvin Jones. At that time was uh, the drummer playing with me. We used to go around at a big sign, oh, Sonny Rollins is coming to town. Everybody was there, but I didn't sound good. And I knew I wasn't playing up to what I should be. So I, re I said, okay, I'm getting out of here. I'm gonna go in the woodshed, as they say and get myself together. Well, you know, that was an accident. I lived down on the Lower East Side, and I experienced some of the problems with the musician trying to play a horn with neighbors. So I had to find some place to practice, and um, uh, I practiced in the house because I had to practice, but I felt guilty sometimes because people, you know, I, I'm, I'm a sensitive person, and I know that people need their privacy in their, in their apartments and so on. So anyway, um, I just happened to be walking on Delancey Street one day because uh, that was the neighborhood I was in, and uh, I had moved down to the Lower East Side, and we had a small apartment there. Uh, we had a nice, actually, uh, uh, there was a nice time. I had a, had a lot of uh, friends there that uh, I was welcomed, really, in the neighborhood by the people on the Lower East Side at that time. And uh, anyway, I was walking along Delancey Street, and I just happened to look up and see these steps. And um, I mean, I wasn't thinking about anything. So I just walked up, and I walked up the steps, and there, of course, was the bridge. And it was this nice, big expanse going over. There's nobody up there. So I walk. I started walking. I said, wow, this is what I've been looking for. This is a private place, I can blow my horn as loud as I want because the boats are coming on, you know, the boats and the, the subway is coming across, the cars said, wow, this is perfect. And it was just serendipity. Then I began going, getting my horn and going up there and it was a perfect place to practice. I mean, every now and then somebody would cross, you know, would come across, you know. But uh, it was perfect. I'd go up there at night, I'd go up there in the day, I'd go up there, I mean, I'd be up there 15, 16 hours.
Well, I was born in Harlem in 1930. And um, um, of course, I don't know how to compare it with any place else. I never grew up any place else, but it was a nice place. I had a lot of uh, friends. I had a, um, there was a lot of music, a lot of music around. I had music. Um, in, in my home, there was a lot of, but there was also music, all of a lot of after hour clubs and speakeasies. And so it was a place where, um, even though I didn't, I was too young to go into places like the Cotton Club and Elks Rendezvous, I was, I sort of imbibed all of this black culture which was around me. So I think it was a beautiful place to grow up, especially for a person that wanted to be a musician like myself, you know. I used to make a lot of jokes and play around uh, when I was a kid. Uh, they used to call me Jester, that was one of my nicknames. Um, I guess I was pretty, pretty uh, good guy. I was the, um, when I was about 13 or 14, I was the, uh, Although the guys around me were a little older, they selected me to be the president of their uh, of our little club on the block we lived on. And um, years later, that struck me. I said, well, gee, why did they select me? Um, you know, I'm not trying to be, gee, what a great guy I am, but... Um, Probably that might have had something to do with the fact that I eventually ended up being a band leader, you know. And so anyway, but I was a guy, I liked sports. I played a lot of um, all sort of uh, city sports as a youth on the streets of New York, stickball, uh, boxball, all of these things, marbles that we played in New York City. So, um, I guess you could say that I was sort of a um, athletic uh, person, you know. I liked school, um, but I had one teacher in school when I was in elementary school. Named her name was Miss Mrs. Love, and she was she was the most wonderful woman. I. I'll never forget her because she skipped me into a high grade, but I was doing the work, but she inspired a lot of, inspired me to do good schoolwork. And uh, I'll never forget Mrs. Love, Miss Love, I don't know if it's Mrs., I, you know, but um, she was the first teacher that really inspired me to excel. And um, so I guess I began to uh, like school a little better. And then of course I had a few other teachers and you know, a uh, few, but uh, Mrs. Love was sort of the uh, one that I always remember. So because of her, I guess I would have to say that I like school, you know. I guess I went to sort of a disadvantaged uh, high school. Uh, we did take Macbeth, but uh, it, it, I really didn't understand to, you know, understand it wasn't, it wasn't explained very well. So the teachers were a little bit lacking, I think. Uh, but, um, I'm trying to remember a book. You know, when I was a kid, there was a book that I got when my father was a career Navy person. He was in the Navy all of his uh, career. So one time they took the uh, children of the Navy families to the Brooklyn Navy Yard where he was stationed at the time and they had a, a Christmas party. And uh, I, I remember that uh, one of my gifts was a book about uh, Chinese outrigger boats, you know? And I never forget that. But um, I wasn't a particularly um, avid reader until later. 
later on, I, I became really uh, uh, a voracious reader, and I sort of uh, uh, educated, educated myself because I just went to high school. You know, I just had a high school uh, education and probably a sub or high school, really. My brother was sort of a classical uh, player of violin, my older brother. And he used to practice around the house all the time. And then my sister, my older sister, she played. And they were both classically trained and so I was the youngest kid and I listened to them, you know, playing and I, I enjoyed it tremendously. So they tried to start me on piano about uh, six years old, I guess it was. But, you know, by that time I was more interested in playing in the street. So I never, it wasn't until I wanted to play the saxophone that I began. So then I would had some, um, you know, a saxophone teachers and went to little music schools and stuff like that and had private mm -hmm. teachers, you know. But uh, I never had sort of the formal education that my uh, older brother and sister had, you know. So I always felt inferior to them, you know. I had an uncle that played saxophone and <laughs> my mother uh, took me over to see him, you know, and said, well, uh, I think his name was Hubert, you know. So she said, well, Hubert, you know, he wants to play saxophone, you know, so Anyway, Hubert got me this uh, little um, used horn, of course. I mean, uh, it was okay, but I mean, it was a used alto saxophone. And I remember, boy, when I got that horn, I was really happy, you know. And uh, I played it, and uh, you know, it was great. I had pictures taken with it and everything, you know. This, I was about eight years old at that time. I'd listened to a lot of music. And um, I became enamored of this fellow, um, Louis Jordan. He had a, a, a rhythm and blues, I guess you would call it today. And um, my, uh, my uncle's girlfriend had a lot of his records, you know, and I used to, uh, my uncle used to take care of me a lot, you know, quite a bit. In fact, I love going to uh, uncle and uh, my uncle uh, Ruben and uh, Lizzie, his girlfriend. I love going there because he would take me to these cowboy movies and then I'd hear this music. You know, she had all of these uh, old blues guitar players like um, Arthur Crudup and uh, Lonnie uh, Johnson and all of these guys. So I love uh, when uh, I was had uh, my uncle had to take care of me in the day sometime. But um, anyway, uh, I listened, Louis Jordan was a guy that I really, boy, I really, you know. And um, so also, just as a coincidence, I guess, Louis Jordan was playing right in a club right next to my elementary school in Harlem. And every day coming out of school, I'd see these these uh, eight by tens, you know, with Louis Jordan, he had on the cutaway tuxedo and the shiny horn, you know, and the, you know, the whole uh, white bow tie, the whole thing, you know. So boy, I said, this is, you know, this is what I'm gonna be, you know, this is what I wanna be, a saxophone play, you know. And uh, and I liked his, you know, music. So uh, I, I sort of decided pretty early that that's what I wanted to do, you know. In the musical realm, I had a, a Coleman Hawkins was his, uh, the, uh, after Louis Jordan, I began to gravitate to a more sophisticated, I might put it that way, uh, but not comparing the two, but Coleman Hawkins had a more uh, intellectual approach maybe to music. I mean, he played a lot of more 
very difficult things. Okay, so he became my really idol. I wanted to uh, play tenor, you know, I've had alto before. So anyway, in the musical field, I would say those were my early idols. Uh, saxophone. I always loved Fats Waller because I heard him as a boy and I just loved any, anything he did, you know. Um, other than that, my grandmother was what you may call a uh, black activist. She was involved with Marcus Garvey. She was involved with, um, you know, Marcus Garvey and the Communist Party, all of these things were sort of lumped together. So I don't think, I don't believe she was a communist, but she was a black nationalist, you know, I mean, Certain groups would lump them all together, but there, there were distinctions. At any rate, I became um, a devotee of Paul Robeson because uh, my grandmother used to take me uh, to a lot of his uh, rallies. And I remember um, marching and everything for Paul Robeson. And, um, Let's see who else who else was a big uh, influence on me is um, Marcus Garvey was a little bit before I could I didn't I didn't really know I mean I knew of him but I I didn't really know him enough but Paul Robeson was you know I was there and saw him speak and everything was very very and saw him in the movies so he was a big hero to me you know. Yeah. I'm a very um, politically aware person. And uh, however, I'm not, I'm not like an anti other group, I'm not like anti white or something like that. I've never been like that. But I'm a politically active person. Uh, like one of the big favorites in the house was. Uh, uh, Henry Wallace, but he was a big, uh, big uh, uh, person in, in the house, and um, of course we uh, uh, we were fans of the New Deal, of course, and of course uh, we were also on uh, what they called home relief at that time, and I remember uh, going to the uh, home relief place and getting the. Uh, boxes of food, you know, that we got. So um, Franklin Roosevelt was a pretty big person, you know. Uh, and uh, so I think that's what I, I reflected. I mean, I was a very um, politically act, active all my life, and I've been that way. But as I said, I'm not an angry person. I'm that angry at at anybody, you know. I mean, every now and then you get mad, but I'm not an angry person. I'm not a, uh, I never was in the, in the uh, uh, well, it's just against my personality. I think I have a very um, mild spiritual side, which uh, doesn't allow me to get too politically active, you know. You know, I think I might be a, a conscientious objector or something like that if it ever ever came down to it, really. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, but I certainly believe in human rights and so on and so forth, you know. I think it's impossible to be black in the United States and not experience discrimination. Um, but uh, I, re in fact, I was talking to somebody, Kareem, matter of fact, tonight, and he was tell asking me about uh, when I went to uh, Benjamin Franklin High School. We, my group of students coming from Edward Stitt, junior high school were the sort of the first black integrated busing group really 
because uh, Benjamin Franklin High School was a brand new high school which was built down in an Italian part of town, Little Italy. No, not Little Italy, because Little Italy is downtown. This was uh, Italian Harlem, 116th Street and Pleasant Avenue. Anyway, uh, this was a brand new school and I guess they were having trouble um, uh, with the student population and they needed to disperse it or whatever the reason, but we were the experiment. We went, we, uh, took the bus and then the train down to Benjamin Franklin High School. Uh, we met a lot of resistance from the neighborhood. Uh, um, Frank Sinatra came down to our school and sang and told the kids not to fight. Uh, in our little auditorium, a Nat King Cole trio came down and, you know, said, don't fight and all that. And uh, it, it, was, it, it was good. I think it helped a lot and the, and the kids began to get along. Um, coming from that neighborhood, there was also, this is a communist person who was a big hero in our house also, Vito Marcantonio. He was a communist, and he came from that part of Harlem, Italian Harlem. And, but Vito Marcantonio was a very uh, liberal person. See, these lines are blurred because to be in favor of treating a, a black person as an equal, some people would say, oh, well, he's a communist automatically. This is the thinking that prevailed as you I'm sure no many parts of the country. So uh, Vito Marcantonio was great, and he was uh, from our part, you know, he was from where we went to school, that area. So I, um, I was a politically active person. I, I, I was always uh, interested in how to uh, make the society a better place, you know as I still am because it's still not a perfect place. Once I started when I was around eight years old or so, I knew that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a musician. So I uh, kept playing. I was really at it. You know, there's one thing about me. I was a guy that would practice. Once I started practicing, my mother had to call me to, you know, stop practicing, come and eat dinner, you know, I mean, because I was in my own world. And I, I'm like that up to this day, really, except that I'm older now and I can't practice like 15 hours a day, but I still have the same inclination, you know, and same spirit. But um, I, I kept at it, and by the time I was about... Um, uh, 14, I guess we got a little uh, neighborhood band, you know. And then uh, by the time I was 17, I was, we had a neighborhood band and I was beginning to get uh, recognized by some of the uh, older people, the older musicians. And uh, then by 18, I, was, I made my first recordings, you know. So I was, I was straight, I was on that track. I was on the track to be a professional from that early age, from eight years old, I would say. Well, that's what gave me encouragement because that they would, you know, take to a young kid. I mean, then I knew, well, gee, I must have something going. Because even though I'm, a, I'm pretty, I was never shy about playing with them, but I was still in awe of them, you know. So the fact that I was accepted by Thelonious Monk and all these guys, I mean, they, you know, I mean, they looked at me almost as being an equal, you know. In fact, some of them did. I mean, it was some... Talking about it now is somewhat embarrassing to me, but in, in, in actuality, some of these great musicians looked at me as being 
contemporary with them, you know, and of course they're much younger, you know, younger, at least four or five years younger than most of the guys. Uh, and uh, this was a, it was a source of um, gratification to me that they thought I was good enough. So that gave me it, the uh, really impetus to, well, I know I must be on the right track, you know, keep playing. I didn't know how technical you want to get, but I consider myself sort of a uh, stream of consciousness player. And uh, or what later was to be known as free jazz player. I think I'm a, I'm basically that's what I am. I'm a free, I mean, I'm, I just play stream of consciousness. And uh, so I had to sort of learn, in a way, how to play with uh, uh, the strictures of uh, bebop and all these things. I had to learn that because I'm just a really just a natural player, you know. I listened to my brother playing uh, with a violin uh, etudes and practicing. Uh, I listened to a lot of music around uh, Fats Waller and all of these uh, uh, James P. Johnson piano rolls. We had a, a piano roll uh, uh, with his. Th I just heard a lot of music. Louis Jordan, I used to hear the um, uh, Amateur Night in Harlem from the Apollo Theater, uh, which had every, all the bands would come through for one week. So I just heard a lot of music, you know. And uh, where do I get my, and then I listened, I went to a lot of movies, you know, because in the days when I was growing up, that was the television of the day, movies. So I went to a lot of movies, I heard a lot of movie music, you know, and I, was, and I liked a lot of the music, uh, Jerome Kern and, all of these people, you know. Uh, Jerome Kern is one of my uh, favorites, but I, but I have others too, you know. And um, so that's where I guess I get my inspiration from. I mean, I just have a lot of music in my mind that I heard as a child. And uh, I guess it comes out when I'm playing, but you know, I know a lot of songs, I mean, you know, uh, the words of some of them, but I mean, I know a lot of melodies. My head is just filled with music. And when I'm improvising, they come out at different times, you know, and surprises my, me, you know. Gee, I played something that I, I hadn't, didn't know that I was in my mind, the recesses of my mind, you know. So I guess that's where you might say I get my ideas from. I mean, if I mean, if you can put, if you want to put it that way, those things are in in my mind. I am looking for a more deeper um, level of creation, uh, but that's but these sources are sort of on the surface, definitely. But I find that I'm looking for something deeper and I think there is a deeper level that comes in at some point. But without a doubt, these are my influences and the things that are in my mind are the, you know, movies and jazz bands and all, everything, all music. I like all kinds of music, you know, really. I'm trying to get a deeper sense of expression musically. I mean, I, people tell me, oh, gee, son, are you still practice? Or how come you, well, I'm still, searching, so I'm not, you know, I mean, I still am trying to get to something 
hopefully more profound than what I'm doing now. And uh, I think it's possible. I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, it's there, but, I have, but it's not always, every now and then I get a little snatch of it, you know. When I have a particularly good performance, I, I know it. But you know, these, it doesn't happen more than maybe a few times a year, if I'm lucky, that I really get into something which is really where I'd like to be all the time. Um, but it's something, you know, it's something that, that I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not there yet. I mean, I hope there's time to get there, you know, because I'm not 15 years old anymore. But, I, you know, there's something else there that I'm still striving for. I'm dissatisfied and I'm always striving. There's, there's musicians that I know who are more talented than me and more gifted than me. They don't have to do that. They can just, uh, you know, and a lot of guys have learned their craft and they get to a place and they're satisfied and the stuff they do is great. So it's an individual thing. In my case, my thing is constantly looking for something else. I'm not sat satisfied. Yet. I know there's more there, and I want to. You know, I don't think I've expressed myself yet, really. But I, every now and then, a few times a year, uh, I have a tremendous uh, uh, concert where I really feel that I'm beginning to break the barrier and uh, really get into a deeper spiritual place, you know, and it happens, when it, when it happens, then you know, wow, this is, you know, I'm, I'm right, there is something else, there is something more than what is here, you know. It means the ability to stay in a good hotel, Um, to not worry a lot about financial things, you know. I mean, I'm not a big movie star. I mean, I'm not in that category, but I am able to put food on the table. So success enables me to do that. I'm not, a, I'm not a person that wants a lot of those things. I'm not a materialistic person, so it's easy for me to satisfy those things, really. But nevertheless, it, uh, I know there are people who uh, find it difficult uh, economically sometimes. Uh, so success probably means that, um, to me it doesn't mean that much because I explained to you before that I'm still searching for a little bit more deeper expression. So I haven't, I don't feel myself completely satisfied successfully, I mean, as a success, you know, I've got, no, but in the material way, I'm known, some people know me. Uh, uh, in life is a little bit, some maybe a little bit easier. Uh, uh, like in the little town I live in upstate New York, I've been getting a lot of publicity and everybody up there now is I've blown my cover. I mean, everybody's, oh, gee, Sonny, you know, you hear my, but uh, I don't know. I mean, people may treat me a little better in some, you know, look, say, wow, this guy's somebody, you know. But um, for me, it doesn't. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I want to be a perfect individual. I'm, I am a spiritual person in the extent that I, understand what life is about, how difficult it is, 
how difficult it is for me to kind of be the person I want to be. Better habits, better eating habits, better exercise habits, better golden rule habits towards other I mean, all these things, uh, be according to my spiritual belief, um, is important for my development of my soul, so to speak. I mean, I don't want to get too esoteric here, but this is this is what's important to me. So that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I want. That's important to me, and that's what I'm trying to. And then that's the hardest thing for people to take care of themselves and not overeat or. or you know, not do these little things which are talking to ourselves. And we know that we, the difference between right and wrong. We know that inside, even though we disregard it. This is life. This is the struggle of life to be better at people. I feel that that's, that's how I've figured out what life is all about. So... This is what I'm trying to do. So life is a um, opportunity, and uh, but the hardest battle is with ourselves, and that's what I realize, and that's what that's what I'm doing, you know. There are certain concerts that I play, performances when I I do feel that I've reached a higher level. Um, and when that happens more as a normality rather than really, then I'll feel that I'm there. And I think I can get there. I mean, I know there'll, then there'll probably be something else I, I need to do, but I do feel that I'm getting closer to uh, more of a complete expression, you know, and uh, you know, it's a reachable goal. It's not something which is never going to be. I think I can, you know, but as I said, that doesn't mean that'll be the end. There's always be something else to do. But I think I'm, I, I can reach, I know I can get to a better place, you know. I would say that they have to love what they're doing. See? Never mind the material, you know, because a lot of people come to me and a lot of kids and say, Sonny, what should I, you know, uh, what should I practice or what should, you know, how can I get to be a successful musician? You have to love what you're doing. You have to believe in what you're doing. And if you believe in what you're doing and well, my personal thing is if you're not hurting anybody or harming anybody else, um, that's it. Just stay on that path. If you're looking for money, for material success, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to, I don't, I don't know. There's no advice because I don't want to think like that because I don't believe that's the, the meaning of life. I'm not, a, I'm not a materialist. I don't believe in consumerism and all this stuff. So, but if for, for a young person that's a scientist, wants to be a musician, wants to be a painter, sculptor, and you love it, then give yourself to it. That's all. I mean, and th and this is a, this is the only way to uh, do it. That's its own re reward, really. And uh, if you succeed, I don't know. It, it's a matter of what you just said. What is success? I don't know. But giving yourself to something you believe in that is success. So uh, I would tell people to really uh, get with what you're doing, uh, with abandon. Do your thing and really want to do it and believe in it and uh, block out the rest of the world because you are the world. See, that's you are the world, not, the, not these other people around you. Or, 
and your project, your love, your art, that's the world. That's where you have to be. I went to India back in the uh, 60s when I was interested in yoga and, um, and uh, studying di different philosophies and so on. Um, there's a concept there that uh, we have different, there, there, there are different ages of existence. Uh, as we go into the 21st century, uh, we shouldn't put too much, <laughs> we shouldn't put too much faith in how this century is going to come out because I'm going to revert to what my answer was a moment ago. You, I, individually, that is the war. That's the battle that we have. It doesn't matter what happens in the sense to the environment, to nations fighting each other, to tribalism, to uh, diseases taking up. That doesn't really matter. What matters is you winning the battle with yourself. So in a sense, the 21st century is like, uh, in Indian philosophy, they have something they call Kali Yuga. That's sort of one whole age of existence where people live and then, then they have another age, some, something like what they talk about, the Aquarian age, I mean, things, you go into different phases and existence changes. I mean, these are things that are beyond um, uh, my mind. You know, I'm a simple human being. But the principle I know is there. I can't explain everything, but the principle of us taking care of our own problems individually, not nationwide, not how to solve the 21st century individually. That's, to me, the whole um, ball game, the ball of wax. So that when you say the 21st century, well, I mean, it's not really important. I mean, you could look at it and there's so many problems, but don't get bogged down in those. The problem is within ourselves. That's the problem. So in a sense, uh, I'd like to be of the world and worry about the environment and pestilence, and all, but deeper, the real place where I feel comfortable, and I think most people do feel comfortable, is in themselves. And in that sense, we don't need to worry about the 21st century. That, that, do, do, do you understand what I mean? I, I don't mean turn off and don't help an old lady up off the street. I don't mean that. I just mean put in perspective and realize that our battle is with ourselves to make ourselves better. Once we do that, the whole universe will be better. Well, I would like to be remembered as someone who um, made choices and tried to make my, just like I was, make myself a better person and who didn't listen to the crowd and went the way that my conscience, if you want to put it that way, I listened to my conscience. I would like to be remembered as a person that did that. Therefore, I was able to do, make certain changes in my personal life and uh, strengthen myself as a person, individual.
I mean, my music and all that stuff, that's, I, I mean, I, I, I don't even think about that. I mean, my thing is my uh, personhood and, and trying to be a better person and, have, and fighting that fight within myself. That's how I'd like to be uh, remembered. You know, so that other people would say, well, gee, yeah, Sonny uh, uh, stopped eating uh, a pork, for instance, or, or uh, uh, he stopped doing some detrimental thing uh, and got himself, a, you know, and he made that fight and he did it and he's better for it. And so that's how I like to be remembered, you know. And to be that, be remembered like that, I've got to keep fighting, <laughs> which I'm doing every every day, really, you know. I mean, this is a constant fight till we leave this plane and go someplace else, but the fight is, is constant. It's a, uh, you know, and it's great. It's, it's a great opportunity that life gives us to uh, use it and do so in, in a positive way. It's great. It's a fight, and it's a lot of stuff out here, but, you know, it's great. I've spent a lot of time uh, practicing and working, and I played with some great people, and I've, uh, um, they've liked me. I've liked, so I've, as far as my profession, yeah, I've, I'm not ashamed of that. I've done a lot, and... Uh, you know, and uh, influence some people, and I, some young people say, oh, I, gee, I really, you know, like her playing, and you change my uh, way of life, even. Some people have uh, said that to me. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. But uh, my real joy, if I could be remembered, would be to say, well, Sonny was a guy that wanted to improve himself regardless of where society was at, you know, that would be, if that, if I could get to that point, that would be, I would say, why, well, I really made, made a difference, you know, but probably would never happen, but, you know, that you had the question, so that's what I'd like to be remembered like that, you know. <laughs>